everyone to Brooklyn for Peace's Pathmakers to Peace Honoree Reception. I want to thank all of you for venturing out this evening to support a peace and social justice organization that now, more than ever, is needed in this world climate. And also to honor these outstanding and unique pathmakers to peace. Now we don't have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of activity tonight and I don't have a lot of time. They told me not to run my mouth, so I'm not going to do that. But before we get started, I'd like to begin with giving a big giant shout out and a gigantic thank you to two outstanding women who as parents back in the early 80s got together around the kitchen table and decided that they wanted to empower their community and contribute to building a more peaceful and just world. It started out as Brooklyn Parents for Peace, and now it's just Brooklyn for Peace. Brooklyn Gran <laughs> Parents for Peace. The co-founders, Carolyn Rusty Eisenberg and Dr. Charlotte Phillips. Voice 
a reason when we get into these extremely heated debates about, ironically, how to move to a peaceful outcome when we're at board meetings. Uh, his keen analytical ability to look at the raw and straight truth is necessary when you get into a room full of grassroots organizers, and I'm sure all of you can relate to that. Um, he's always making sure that we at Brooklyn for Peace stay focused on our mission, and another great thing about him is that he has a very dry sense of humor, and, and I like that. So now, help me welcome one of the vice chairs of Brooklyn for Peace, David Tykowski. out of the way for the honorees. Uh, let me acknowledge a few people who are in the room and who have been uh, supportive. Uh, Brooklyn for Peace is a 501c3 organization. That means your contributions are tax deductible. That means we never, ever engage in partisan politics. <laughs> ever. <laughs> However, we would like to acknowledge uh, the City public advocate who was, oh no, she's not yet there yet. Uh, <laughs> a, a member of the council, Tish James, who was here with us tonight. <laughs> I do thank her for all of her support over the years. And uh, is council member Bradlander still here? He was. He escaped before he was fingered. Um, <laughs> So, I, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge um, a few people who have been very active and supportive in the organization. First, uh, Tara Curry, uh, who was our original website designer. And since no organization at this point is allowed to exist without a website, we wouldn't be here without Tara. So, Tara, we you so much. of our peaceful board meetings. Um, we hope that um, actually the board's give and take is what makes the organization at least mildly successful. Uh, we hope uh, that some of you who are in this room will consider joining with us on the board going forward. But in the meantime, we think the board members want to stand up and be acknowledged by you all.
Actually, I think that's a good point. Uh, those of you who are, have been admiring my button from afar. No? Look, we believe, as I said, there are many paths to peace, and fashion is one of them. We think you need to have a button. So we have buttons on every table, and we ask everyone to wear a button. And we do this, not just because we have an impaired fashion, but because we think it is important that people publicly announce that they are supporting a culture of peace, and that they're willing to stand up and be counted in a visible way. So your remote friends here are not going to, you know, be too up if you wear a baseball. So we hope that you will consider wearing one not just now, but tomorrow with the office or as you go to your uh, next event. Right. Unlike what we do with art, one of the things that Brooklyn for Peace does do is to be present in a number of street fairs. And, you know, it's, it tells you something about the way we raise money, that it's very important to us to sell the buttons at the street fairs. Tonight, this is a special one-time deal. Take the buttons, we're not charging a dollar.
from some of the most underserved middle and high schools in Brooklyn. That organization is now 22 years old. Second, my colleagues and I initiated, developed, brought to power a rank and file caucus that became the new leadership in the Professional Staff Congress of CUNY. And now is one of the most progressive and activist union locals in New York City and perhaps the nation. So why turn to develop the new movement, the food justice movement, in the form of the Brooklyn Food Coalition? As Brooklyn for Peace would say, there are many paths to peace and many paths to educating, activating, and creating a mass movement. The food justice movement addresses three intertwined issues. The struggle to provide healthy food for all, the creation of sustainable food systems, and justice for food workers. These issues provide dynamic ways to engage people in solving day-to-day -day problems they experience on very grassroots and concrete levels. And they open the door to educate and rouse people about the growing and dangerous control the multinational corporations have over our lives. The food corporations affect all of us every day. They dominate our bodies, our pocketbooks, our minds. With billions of dollars of advertising, they train our children to become their lobbyists. Parents, teachers, faith leaders, health professionals all see the results every day. The food corporations not only breed diet-related diseases on a mass scale, but they also contribute mightily to climate change. The food system accounts for one-third of all greenhouse gases. These multinational food corporations are key players in increasing inequality in income and political power. This movement to change the food system is quite homegrown. It's local in its organizing and focus. We want fresh, healthy food for our people, and that means locally grown by farmers and producers who care about our collective health, not just profits. But this movement is global as well, across the planet. The same multinational corporations that control our food system are pushing farmers off the land, grabbing that land, trying their best to control what's grown, how it's grown and produced, and how it is distributed. They play monstrous, they create monstrous policies like the Trans-Pacific Partnership that would negate the power of national governments and movements to protect our environment and workers so that they can create more profits. If we let that continue, we will have several outcomes. First, we won't be able to feed ourselves and we'll be continuously dependent upon the multinational corporations for our survival. Second, and don't forget, in the Global South, about 75% of the people are farmers. Second, we will have, and in the United States, it's between 1% and 2% of our people are farmers. So we see what's happened here, and that can happen everywhere else. Second, we will have increasing climate change, because the methods they use for factory farming, food processing and distribution, heat the planet. And as more and more farmers are pushed off the land and food and water are controlled by these multinationals, it means that there will be more failed states, more civil and international wars. So all of these factors are dynamically linked. In response, our movements must be linked. We need to engage in strategic thinking and creative campaigns that will challenge the power of the multinational corporations, those that deal in food, energy, and armaments. And we must maximize our alliances and unity. The Brooklyn Food Coalition empowers communities through grassroots organizing, supporting parents' efforts to improve school food, advocating for city policies that advance local and healthy agriculture and food processing, supporting food workers in their struggles for dignity, safety, and living wages. We've been fortunate to have young people and people of color in the leadership and in the trenches of the food justice movement, 
and in the Brooklyn Food Coalition. As I look back on the years behind me, and I look forward to enjoying the years ahead of me, I know that we must engage the people most affected by the corporations that dominate our lives and threaten our futures. It is with them that the dream of participatory democracy must rest. I have had a privileged life of good work, good health, good friends and family, and good movements to carry me through. I wish everyone in this room all of that and more. We have a world to change, and we must do that together. Thank you, Brooklyn for Peace, for carrying this banner for over 30 years. seeds that it began when less than a week after September 11th, 2001, 
we invited members of the then fledgling Dialogue Project to come to meet. And it was then that I first met Debbie Amentasser, um, a meeting that provided that it proved more fruitful than we might ever have expected. Within two years, the Peace Walk became a reality after wonderful gatherings at Debbie and Najee's home and the brainstorming that included the late, great Charlie Horowitz and Reverend Tar Martinez and soon that of Adam Carroll um, and others that I'm going to mention in a minute in this room. We just walked our 10th annual walk returning as we have for several years to September 11th. And I can't be honored for my work on the Peace Walk without asking those of you in the room who helped to plan it to stand. So Tom Martinez and Dr. Jaber and Wael Musfar, if you would stand. I don't think that was clear. Debbie and Naji are here, but they are part and parcel of the Peace Walk. Um, children of Abraham, Jews, Christians, Muslims, walking together in Brooklyn in peace. The statement we wrote together says, we believe that by walking, we demonstrate that it's possible for us to walk in peace and live peacefully as neighbors. We understand ourselves to have grown from the same roots, starting with the biblical Abraham, and so we call ourselves the children of Abraham. Like many children of the same father, we have disagreements and arguments, and in too many parts of the world, those arguments erupt in hatred and violence. We abhor that violence, and we pledge to continue to work together here in Brooklyn in peace and for peace. Kolo Kainu, the congregation I founded almost 21 years ago, is also at its best a place where divides can be bridged where many different people can come together to create one community that I sometimes like to think of as an open tent. The place where, like our ancestors Abraham and Sarah, we open the tent sides as an invitation and a statement. Kolod's mission statement says in part, as individuals of varying sexual orientations, gender identities, races, family arrangements, and Jewish identities and backgrounds, we share a commitment to the search for meaningful expressions of our Judaism in today's uncertain world. Today's uncertain world is never far from our door or yours. And the un ongoing uncertainty that is Israel and Palestine knocks loudly. With a helpful push from some Brooklyn for Peace folks and others, we became, a couple of years ago, the first synagogue to open our tent sides to a public discussion of one form of boycott, academic and artistic boycott. Then, the panel's opinions varied. The discussion sometimes got heated. Some in the audience were thrilled and others were annoyed or horrified. No buildings fell and no lightning struck. And sadly, no one in Israel or Palestine seems to have heard it at all either. <laughs> um, but we were glad to have hosted the congregation and remain glad to be a congregation where a wide range of voices can be heard. Our value statement says, we believe that Jews have an obligation to grapple with the many issues and emotions connected to our historic attachment to Israel and the current political situation in Israel and Palestine. While we join Jews everywhere in facing Jerusalem while we pray, we have no consensus on political solutions nor their philosophical underpinnings. I have to ask Kolokainu members and clergy who are here to stand, starting with my partner in all things, Cantor Lisa B. Siegel. But sometimes it may be better to sit with the uncertainty. At Kolo Kainu, we famously say, thanks to my partner, Catherine Conroy, who coined the phrase, doubt can be an act of faith. <laughs> we try to sit with our doubts and no easy answers. 
finding comfort in community connections and ancient words. So, excuse me, the world has rarely been as uncertain as it was these past couple of weeks when Sammy Cohen Eckstein um, was killed by a van and our hearts shattered. Sammy and his family have been part of our congregation for many years and he was to become bar mitzvah in the middle of November. So my words tonight are for Gary Eckstein and Amy Cohen, steadfast supporters and organizers for Brooklyn for Peace, and for their brave daughter Tamar. May they receive comfort as long as they need it, and find down the road in the cracked foundation of their lives a bit of light. Thank you. Diane Smith, who is a member of the board of SHIP. development 
And she, at first I said, no, I kept, she kept coming, kept coming, 9 o'clock at night, she's knocking on my door, <laughs> trying to get me to come out. I said, i got to go down here to find out how it's fairy and what's fairy all about. And thank God I've been there since like 2005. And we're still fighting, and I enjoy the work we do, and the family that it feels like when you're working with the people down at Fury. Um, Fury also do, we have rallies, march, we do protests, and one of our famous chants is no justice for peace. Meaning, we can't sit still while our families are suffering to put food on the table, pay rent, get fair wages while rich keep getting richer in our city. Thank you. And while I'm thinking of it, I would like to say I had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Phillips because she was one of the pediatricians with my grandchildren. And she was a very good pediatrician. Fury has worked with Brooklyn Food Coalition in our successful campaign to win a new affordable supermarket on Myrtle and also with the Social Justice. We also work with the Social Justice Synagogue, the Rabbi Ellen Lippman heads to reopen the Gowanus Community Center. Thank you. I would like to thank our supporters for standing with Fairy as allies and donors, especially those who have supported us for the past several months during our executive director being hospitalized. Uh, thank you, Ed Goldman. He's always been there for Fairy.
reprehensible for our government to be locking up uh, people simply because of their ethnicity and their religion uh, in the wake of 2000, the bombings in 2001. Again, the practice of targeting Muslims has not ceased as of now. We have a lot of work to do. Now, our next speaker is a founder of the American, the Arab American Association of New York. He has been one of the great fighters for justice for his community and one of the leaders to us in pointing out the many injustices that our government has been perpetrating and has been working very hard to make the Arab American community a great part of this great city. Dr. Jabbar.
I was the one who opened it. And that will be, and I was celebrating the Eid and giving some sweets and goodies. And she exclaimed, Dr. Jabber, I didn't think you are Muslim, I thought you were Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether I, should I take that as an insult or as a compliment. <laughs> because it's true, I work in, in Park Slope and uh, Borough Park and people say Shalom. <laughs> Go look at me, my nose, my hair, my face. <laughs> you can't, can't say I'm not Jewish. <laughs> Which goes back to the truth. Palestinians and Arabs are Semites. They were Abraham children. That's what the princess of Abraham, which I participated from the inception. And we started the first walk from Dawood Mosque, State Street, if you remember uh, the Bible. Yeah. I was there, and we crossed the bridge, Brooklyn Bridge with that. So now, to say that, it was a wake up call. From that on, I used my name tag and emphasize is Ahmed. It's a Muslim name. Since then, we start to think, what are we doing? We are active in international politics. We go for demonstration, we protest this, we protest that. But we're not doing anything to the community. And that's what I revised my thinking. We should work with our community, with our neighbors, with our interfaith group, with our other organization to show we exist and we are American citizens to stay. The first Unitarian Church hosted yesterday the 13th dinner for the Muslim community, 13th year the dinner for the Muslim community in Brooklyn Heights. Four years ago, Brooklyn Heights Clergy Association, which is 15 churches, two synagogues, and one mosque, elected Dr. Jaffer to become their president. In a time when Islamophobia were flooding the tabloids in New York City. That I appreciate, because these people know what they want to do. I opened my mosque and made the point called open house policy. So every mosque which I'm involved is, when I when I'm involved with, open their doors for neighbors, for people, for politicians, for the NYPD <laughs> to come and visit and see what's going inside. It's not a terrorist place. I invited Commissioner Kelly several times to these months. I sat with him several times. And with the Associated Press, had two years already publishing what the NYPD surveillance system is doing to the Muslim community, I was upset at these reports here. How can I be with you? And putting me on your advisory council, Commissioner Kelly put Dr. Jabir as advisory council for the Muslim community. And then stab me in the back and say, guess what? I have informants in your mosque who are reporting and are recording what you are saying, and they are photographing people who come in and out. I couldn't believe it. Really, I couldn't believe it. And then, when I knew that 60% that of New Yorkers are, are, are okay with that, that even made me more furious. How could we replace our civil rights for our security? How could that happen? That's what we are going to fight for and for going to fight for. In 2001, before September 11, the need for the Muslim community was obvious, and that's when I established the Arab American Association of New York, a social organization in Bay Ridge, to help the community, medical care, immigration issues, after-school programming, ESL classes, 
But September 11 came, and suddenly we are facing with different issues. That we are at risk, we are being watched, we are being labeled, we are being attacked. So we switched the gear and we became an advocacy group. And we became more involved in empowerment for our community. And telling them, don't be afraid, we are here to stay, we are American citizens, abide by law. Don't be afraid. And the message went across. And now, our American Association is a friend lead in advocating and NYPD surveillance is being now challenged and our hopefully new mayor will be there. He promised he will do something about it. We had across the New York City coalition for the Muslim holidays, Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fatr, which passed by New York City Council, 50 versus one abstinent, but Bloomberg vetoed it. Now, Blasio and Lothar said they will implement it. Immigration issue, in our American Association, we are the front leader in demonstrating, go to D.C. with the Immigration Coalition, go to Albany. We went everywhere for the rights of immigrants and especially the DREAM Act. We were involved in that. <laughs> it is not good alone. It's a, a work which needs organizations and leading organizations and cooperating with them. So we formed, probably 17 years ago, before, back for student, a group called Arab American Muslim Federation, which is 15 organizations, Muslim organizations, mosques, institutions, who will speak in one voice for the Muslim issues. So with that, I consider myself, if that's the word consider it's peace, then I am on the path for peace. I'm not going to be like our president, Mr. Obama, who received the Nobel Prize for peace. <laughs> Probably because his intention was, but I don't know what he implemented, but I promise the Brooklyn for Peace people, at least for the peace of my mind, I work for peace in the future. And thank you very much.
distinguished company, and I'm not quite sure why I'm here, but to be with Rabbi Lipman, Dr. Jabir, uh, Jabbar, um, um, with Fury, which I wrote a piece for called uh, Pins and Needles, which premiered in Brooklyn. And so I feel very connected to the organization and Nancy Romer. Um, I, I grew up in Brooklyn in the aftermath of the civil rights movement on the heels of the Black Power movement. My parents, Ruby um, and Wallace Notch, my father is here, were social activists in what I call civil servants drag. My parents' <laughs> anger and optimism were partnered in a really creative and forceful way. They educated me through arts and activism, taught me to love my culture by exposing me to writers, to performing artists, and visual artists who were driven to create dynamic and creative work about the African-American experience. My mother had me walking on picket lines from the time I could balance on two feet. She didn't believe that silence was an option to any injustice, and as such, I was raised to be proud, to be loud, to be passionate, to be unapologetic. As a child, my mother... As a child, my mother painstakingly colored in the faces of my picture books with brown crayon. She was determined to bring me up in this beautiful black world, and she believed that activism began at home, and that it was very important that we perceive the world um, from our kitchen table. She went so far as to start something called the Black School with Betty Shabazz, Malcolm X's wife, and Eugenia Clark, who was the wife of Dr. Henrik Clark, and every weekend we Afrocentric children were immersed in the arts and cultures and crafts of Africa. We tie-dyed cloth, we sang traditional African songs, and we learned perfunctory Swahili words, and all of this happened on the corner of Dean Street and Nevins. <laughs> and in many ways, I believe that I went into theater because of the, the way in which I was brought up because I believe that very much the role of the artist is to keep their eyes open when everyone else is a shut. I wish I had said that first, but I did not. But I do believe it. It's a really very beautiful and simple sentiment. We are cultural watchdogs. We stand at attention, observing and reacting. We excavate, uncover, interpret, unravel. We protect tr tradition and then we shape new ones. We look inward and then outward to find better ways to understand ourselves. And I'm a theater artist because I believe that theater helps us explore questions like, how do we love? Why do we go to war? How do we move through pain? How do we find happiness? How do we mourn? How do we heal? It allows us to look at really lofty themes like religion and spirituality and politics and sexuality and death and humanity. Theater is the place where catharsis can occur and demons be exercised. And we live, you know, I don't have to tell anyone in this room, um, that we live in a world that's increasingly interconnected um, through the ascendancy of new media, yet paradoxically more fractured by racism, by religion, by politics, and by economics. Our venerated financial two institutions are crumbling and petty partisan fights are paralyzing our government. Our insatiable need for oil and precious minerals fuel these deadly conflicts in places like Iraq and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Poverty and suffering have become given to the world of abundance, and women continue to fight for very basic human rights in most of the world. Hate, not love, fuel religious um, revolutions, poisoning generations of young men and women who are just simply searching for meaning. We look for solutions in recycling bins and turn on our te television to drown out woes. This is our world, shaped by our own design. It's chaotic and unruly, yet beautiful and infinitely fascinating. And as an artist and as a global citizen, the world continues to demand our attention, and as such we must be these intrepid explorers, daring to venture into uncomfortable zones to unearth difficult truths. We must be unafraid to look honestly at the human condition and try to come to terms with its contradictions and flaws. That means approaching our work not as journalists, but as I do as a fabulator, as a storyteller who's breaking the world rules to reimagine a better world. 
It is the pa paradox, I believe, of the creative process that gives us access to places that we dare not go in our everyday lives. It emboldens us to ask these difficult questions about war, about race, about religion, about love, and about hatred. And ultimately, I believe that theater is a place where we can collectively share our laughter, shed tears, and loudly demonstrate our joy and our frustrations. Theater has this incredible capacity to be soul healing. It allows both the audience and the artist to purge the toxins that we build, out, build up and exercise our demons. And as a writer, um, to speak more personally, I am constantly hunting for a theatrical vocabulary that can sustain the complexity of the world that we live in, a vocabulary that can incorporate the harrowing stories that I've heard from women in crowded refugee claim camps in northern Uganda, the stories that I've heard in Burma about young girls who are being sexually trafficked, the stories that I've heard in um, a church in Biloxi, Mississippi that I went to right after the hurricane, um, where these, um, these folks had lost literally everything, and also these stories that I hear when I'm in cocktail parties in New York City when a woman, after too many cocktails, will pull me over and tell, tell me a story that absolutely chills me to the bone. And what I've discovered in this journey as a playwright is that the stories of women and the stories of those who are marginalized desperately need to be heard.